distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, friends and enemies. Okay, so welcome to this week's Make It Plain. Uh, thanks for listening, uh, wherever you're listening, and thanks for watching. If you are watching on YouTube, please do remember, like, subscribe, do all the things. It does help, and we appreciate the support. Uh, this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm joined by Baseo Twins. Baseo Twins is, I met um, a few years ago at uni, uni things. She's very active in student movements um, as part of the NHS Black Students Campaign, uh, work for Office for Students, done loads of things, has a, a really good Insta uh, show called um, Everything is Political. Also posts uh, polit political intrusive thoughts as well on Insta. Um, really strong commentary, really political. And so me and her just chopped it up. Me and Basel just chopped it up for an hour. Talked about various things, student protests, Gaza, Black, state of black politics in the UK. We tried to list uh, our, our top five men and women who are active in the UK today. Um, just had a conversation about a whole range of things. So you don't need a rant from me today because I ranted quite a bit <laughs> in this conversation. And hopefully we're going to have uh, Baseo back on the pod regularly to just chop up, see what's happening, and talk about what's happening um, in, in the world, what's going on. So no extended rant from me today, but I did just want to say two things. One, I'm a free man. Woo! The police decided NFA, no further action uh, will be taken in my in the case of Hal Calvin Robinson uh, complaining that I called him a house Negro. Uh, what, I guess the police are also saying, oh, who the cap fits, right? Yeah. So anyway, uh, yep, I will not be will not be going to court, will not be going to jail. Um, I'm not going to lie. I am just a little bit disappointed. I was looking forward to them, take, them trying to push this and really trying to take this too far. And, tr and actually, really, one of the reasons I made the video and kind of spelled out, if you haven't seen it, it's called, um, uh, it's not a crime to call a coconut a coconut. And so I make it play a YouTube channel. And I went through Coconut Coon, House Negro, said all of them, right? And, and then one of the reasons was actually to make this point that this is legitimate language. Um, and I hope now there's a statement that I wrote. Uh, that I gave to the police. The police station was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> a slightly shorter version of the statement that's online, but my solicitor just reading out for 10 minutes and the police, just, what are they going to say? Really, what are they going to say? But I, that's not going to set precedent. Like, I think it's really important that we have some precedence here that this is our language and that we defend it. So actually, I was I was kind of up for like, let's let's push this and let's see. Um, so I do think we still have to have to have to work on this. We have to push on this. Um, the statement I wrote is up on Make It Plain. Anybody who gets into a similar situation can please do feel free to use that parts of that, all of that. Also, do feel free to get in touch. Um, the fact that there is a video online that says Has Negro Coon, Uncle Tom, all of these, and has examples and has not been criminalized. I think that tell, should tell us, that should give you some quite good, well, if, it's, if I can say it, then anyone can say it, right? Then you can't, you shouldn't be criminalizing this language. So hopefully it's a step in the right direction. I ain't never going to celebrate Babylon doing things, finally coming to their senses, being dragged down to a police station was not a good use of my time. It was not a good use of my taxpayers' money to have three police officers sitting in a room, listening to my... <laughs> it was just bizarre. You know, you're like, I wrote the, the book Psychosis of Whiteness. I was completely 100% correct. Whiteness is a psychosis. You find yourself in these situations that you just cannot rationally explain, understand in any other way. Completely and utterly delusional. Anyway, so that's the update on the case or non-case as the case may be. Um, other thing I wanted to say is today, uh, it might not be, it definitely be today for, if you're listening to this, um, it might not be today for YouTube, depending on when, put, when we put the video up, but 27th of September, that is Dr. Nicole Andrews, my late wife's birthday. Um, she sadly passed away to, uh, two and a bit years ago now from breast cancer. I will stress this is a breast cancer that disproportionately kills black women, uh, three, tri um, triple negative breast cancer. If you're a black woman, you are three times more likely to die from this than a white woman. Uh, massive health inequality that really is not talked about. Honestly, there's very little research into it, very little discussion about it. Um, and it's a huge, 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 huge problem. Um, Nicole was taken from us way, way, way too early. I've said many occasions Nicole was actually much more intellectually on it than me. Um, you just know who I am uh, because I was a bit louder um, and because we lost Nicole too soon. Uh, she was doing her research was, she had a, had a PhD, passed a PhD with no corrections. 
uh, that was on looking at health, uh, how to how to make public health images of overweight and obesity with black women because obviously NHS don't know how to talk to black people. <laughs> and so it, her work was really about, ironically, trying to do public health work with black women. Uh, she was working on a project with the city council and Lewisham around black uh, health and had really, really good plans and things that she wanted to do and really is a loss to all of us that we lost uh, Nicole. She was also hugely important in Harambe LBU. Um, Harambe LBU, we have the Marcus Garvey Centre and the there's now the Nicole, Dr. Nicole Andrews Community Library in the centre. Uh, we have a book club every month, so if you are in Birmingham, please do come down to the book club. And really, it was Nicole who was the one who got that ground floor renovated. I mean, that was empty for ages. We were trying to get that renovated for time. But it was Nicole who really ma- managed to get the people together, get it renovated. And even when she was heavily pregnant, I, I woke up one day and Nicole was, was gone. I was like, well, when she came back, I was like, where'd you go? I said, oh, uh, there were crackheads in the building. So I had to chase them away. A heavily pregnant self went and chased that crackheads from the building uh, at the time. That was Nicole. Um, she is deeply missed, like I said today. Um, what will be today, 27th of December, uh, is her birthday. Um, in honor of that, we do have on the Make It Plain YouTube channel, we have a, there was a, we recorded, we got some old footage and actually going to put up some of the old footage recorded of events. One of the events that is up is an event that Nicole did with Dr. Alfie Legal Miller years ago. This was, a, I don't even know the year, but I want to say it was definitely, it was years, a, a good while ago, uh, about four black, Black, uh, no, it was for national. It was for International Women's Day, and it was called "Sisters in the Struggle: The um, Radical Black Feminism of the Black Panther Party." And so Nicole gave a whole talk on that, along with Dr. Alfie Legal Miller. That is recorded. That is up on YouTube. So we're going to reshare that as well uh, for Nicole's birthday. And in the future, I'm going to try and put as much of Nicole's stuff out there, written work, um, any video, and that we've got. But like I said, Nicole way more important intellectually than me. Um, unfortunately, we lost her way too soon. So. Um, yeah, rest in peace, Nicole. It's obviously a difficult time. Family and that. But we have to celebrate. It's important to celebrate the lives of people that have gone on to the ancestors. So, like I said, no big rant from me today. Uh, we're going to get into the conversation. Me and Buseo Twins. Uh, please do listen, check it out. Hopefully you enjoy uh, the conversation that we had. And hopefully it's educational as well. All right, this week we're really happy to be joined by Buseo Twins. Um, who I've known in some capacity for a long time, right? University of Birmingham, I want to say. Was it Birmingham? I, no, I was at LSE. Okay. But I remember it was the student union politics vibe. You you are a legend in that space. You know, there's a lot of thought leadership that you inspired a lot of us, like student activists, ACSs and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, so that's what it is. I came down to LSE to do a talk yeah, about Yeah, you come to LSE. I think we were doing campaigns about deco- um, decolonizing the curriculum, from, you know, the disparities in attainment from different um, ethnic minority groups and stuff. Like you were, I think there was like three of you who were the big names or big champions in it and still is today. So I think it's an honor for me even to be on this now. No, really, that's nice to hear. (laughs) But they say don't meet your idols, so we'll see. (laughs) (laughs) Don't don't meet me an idol would be the thing. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, yeah, usually when you meet people you respect, it don't go well. Yeah. (laughs) I can say there's two exceptions, Patricia O'Carlin's, Kimberly Crenshaw. Okay, yeah, I can imagine. That's my list. (laughs) Yeah, top two, top two, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But generally. So what have you been doing since you were at LSE? What were you doing at LSE? What were you studying? So I studied economic history. Okay. Um, yeah, so in economic history, that was just basically looking at just economic theory over time. And just instead of looking at economics as a science, looking at it as a evolution of history, um, different places in, in the world, of course, you pick different regions of the world to look at. Obviously, today, they're nation states, but at the time, they were just regions. But I chose like Latin America, Africa, Asia. You have to do Britain, of course. Why? Why wouldn't you? Because no one, we all need to be reminded that the steam engine was what created modern day capitalism over and over again. Um, so yeah, so it was it was a lot of that. And I think that's what really made me go, actually, there's nothing different. Everything, everything is the same, nothing's changed. It's the same thing, same cycle, same thing they feed us, but they want to now make it more like religious and make us subscribe to it in a particular way. So yeah, that's what I started at uni. And what have you been doing since? Because now you're a thought leader, right? You have. Oh, well, I'm thinking. Am I a leader? Mm. Who knows? But I'm, I'm thinking. Um, so since then, I went on to do. So I was elected as the president of my student union. And so obviously you get into the whole like NUS student politics activism. Um, went into 
I guess outreach as well, getting people from disadvantaged backgrounds into higher education, because that was a big thing at LSE and all those universities. As you know, there's a lot of kids who look like us and stuff who are capable, smarter than us, who don't get in just because the universities don't budge. They think it's a privilege to get there rather than going, actually, I want the best minds. They come from everywhere. So that was a big thing for me is to do a lot of social mobility, outreach stuff, getting people to higher education. Then I did education policy, worked at office for students, and I helped them develop their strategy for uh, making sure that they close attainment gaps for ethnic amongst ethnic minorities and working class students and then i went into yeah just like community policy um strategy worked at black curriculum for a bit building their policy arm and then i recently uh was at clearview research as a business development manager um just identifying partnerships and stuff um yeah and our mission was to create cl- inclusive research to help organizations who want to better understand ethnic minority demographics. We help them deliver that research. We do a lot of quant, we do quant and qual research. We do participatory research. We do a lot of co-creation, co-production. Um, so yeah. And then now yeah. online, I do political content, trying to make it easier or accessible for people to follow what's going on in the world. Yeah, you've been really, I've been seeing the stuff you've been doing, you do the reels, um, everything's political, right? Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, everything is political. That was my... I felt like it was my attempt to allow people, to encourage people to see the politics and everything, just as straightforward as it is. So people don't say, I'm not into politics and all this stuff. Look at the way the world is going. Look how much we're seeing, at least. Even if things haven't changed, we've seen a lot more social media. And I feel like people weren't equipped with the skills to manage a life where we will be seeing babies' heads blown up and we will be seeing world leaders exposed for what they're doing. And at the same time, we have to submit to the capitalist machine and we also have to take care of our families and i felt like we have to learn how to navigate this new normal and though and therefore there's politics and everything you enter where you need to enter but you're highly political regardless of if you think you are or not yeah do you think i don't know it's an old person talking but mm. do you think the young, younger people have a less political now less engaged we i don't know do you know what it is? It's that with, it's that, do you know what it is? I think that's where I would like to learn about the depths of politics and where you are on the spectrum. Because mm-hmm. I feel like they're hyper aware of things that are going on because it's on the internet. But the way they engage feels a lot less, it feels like a lot less depth and understanding or systemic understanding to engage. So it's like, I can see this is wrong, but they don't link it to imperialism. Yeah. That's my, that's that's where it is. So it's like, they might, they might be more confident. They might be more, they have more incentive to talk about it, of course, but in terms of linking it to why the systems of oppression, touching back with history, knowing what came before to really articulate and understand why it's going on, I think that's where the disconnect happens a lot of the time. And you've now got a generation of people who are also seeing black faces, brown faces in high places. So it's not just easy, it's not easy just to be like, there's racism because X, Y, Z. Now you have to look at it like, okay, Anti-blackness is very different from just general racism in general, but then there's also misogynoir and then there's also um, Islamophobia. And I might be hyper aware and attuned to anti-blackness, but maybe Islamophobia, when it presents itself, I'm slower to respond. Mm-hmm. So I think we're being challenged now to go, were we, were we, anti, were we anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, or were we just anti our own individual oppression? So I think that's where the younger generation, to me, that's what I see. The only, the only caveat I'll give is that I think Climate change is one where they're they're yeah. actually quite advanced. It feels like, and I and I get the existential crisis. So I would give that to them. What, yeah, about yourself? what do you think? Well, I don't. I don't. I think sometimes you romanticize how much people were political back in the day. Because I, I don't know. People mm. have most people been really politically engaged. Probably mm. never. Right. Mm. I think not my generation. Not my generation. Generation before me, there was probably you didn't really have a choice. Like if you're being chased down the street by the NF, or like you know, it's just so obvious. Like, mm. but now, and because of that generation, made a lot of changes, and you know, you, now you can get the kind of overt discrimination has gone away. You can kind of skate through life mostly, kind of thinking it's okay. Mm. So I guess it's not that people are more or less political, but maybe the conditions for making people political yeah. aren't there as much in the same way. Exactly, exactly, and I think you're right about we only grow up with our own generation. So even when we think about generations, I, I don't know what I'm basing it on, but I think even within this generation, I feel like there are some things that feel, there are some things that feel a bit more like two plus two should equal four and they're not. So for example, I'll say that my generation might have been the first generation, I might say that at least we grew up with, we knew about 
apartheid in South Africa. We, it was yeah, in our yeah. storybooks. To some degree, at least we know Mandela, even if it's a social icon. We also yeah. were forced, rightfully, to learn about the Holocaust, right? We understood that. But I feel like now that it's presented via the genocide against, uh, the genocide against Palestinians, mm-hmm. we're struggling to make that quick that quick association that's what i'm concerned about because i feel like we grew up with that it's not this is not our first canon moment where it's like oh my god it's like we grew up with all this information at least and we haven't applied it so i think that's where the expectation of meeting reality can sometimes be concerning because we should know what apartheid looks like but maybe we only know what it looks like when it's south africa specifically in a specific condition in a specific type of violence in a specific way and the new versions of genocide or the different ways genocide manifest we we don't know we don't know how that works yet yeah, I don't know. I was trying to not be sound like an old man before. The young people ain't got no politics. Let's be honest. Also, <laughs> just... <laughs> oh, you don't fit their political. <laughs> no, <I'm> not... <laughs> At least, I don't want to say it bad, but it is like I talk to young people all the time, and obviously, as a, of as a, yeah. as a the university, and there is a, a lack. But I always say this: not you can't blame young people for that. Mm. That's, that's, I'm old enough; I got to blame myself, right? So what's yeah, yeah, yeah. what's happened that young people aren't as politicized? Like you said, like. Back in the day, even in my generation, you'd easily connect um, Palestine to South Africa. Like, it'd just be an obvious thing. Like, it wouldn't really be take a lot of yeah. explaining. Mm. But I think that that's not necessarily there now. But I do think that's because we've, as a community, we've kind of, we don't have, like, when I was growing up, we had bookshops, we had Saturday school, we had lots of community mobilization. You just kind of, there was more ways to know. Whereas now, all that stuff's kind of gone, and we're kind of leaving it to TikTok. Mm. YouTube, the schools, and then we're surprised when kids don't know nothing. Mm. No, that's a good point. And I think I mentioned before about community and the role of community as a force for education. And I feel like modern day it doesn't feel like the word community is multidimensional in the way that we, it, it could be and should be. And I mean that to say, for example, people are not connecting the idea, okay, no, no Saturday schools or no like. Uh, inclusive education or even in terms of gentrification, right? Generally physical community is actually being eroded, right? So you can't yeah. even go outside and learn about the histories of a girl from Bangladesh who will just be your neighbor and you'll learn about Bang- Bangladesh because she'll invite you to her birthday or she'll give you some cultural yeah. food and that's how you learn naturally. Now we're learning about people in such a like parasocial way that community mm. is so hard to like materialize in, 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 in reality, isn't it? It's kind of like, what do we mean by community? Or do we need a, an additional version of community now that we're on social media? Like, how do you make community on social media? I don't know. It should be easier in some ways, right? Like, you have more connections, more information. There's more connection. Mm. Like, you can see what's happening around the world easier than you mm. could back in the day. Mm. But it seems like the more stuff we have and the more connections we have, the less political yeah. we seem to get. Ironic. I've got a question for you, actually. Um, I'm assuming that you, well, you identify as a man. Yes. Yeah. So, EDL riots, mm-hmm. race riots, I don't know what word that we've settled with, Terror- <laughs> domestic terrorism, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. White I'm people sure. going crazy? Just, yeah, <laughs> white, yeah. white people, white people. In. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, basically, right? <laughs> um, there was one thing that me and my friends were talking about at one point, and it was like, and I did like a little video on TikTok, very short, but I feel like I'll go back to it, and it's a good opportunity to ask you now. Do you feel like modern day in britain particularly or maybe black britain modern day um social activism seems to appear more as a feminine duty than Mm. a masculine one and what i mean by that i look around and i see a lot of women as old as time will tell us Mm. women carrying the burden of this talking about this putting themselves in the line of fire losing jobs going to trial all this kind of stuff and it feels as though although we all have our different parts and there's certain elements, gender norms that people feel more, they step into certain positions just because it feels easier. It feels as though as a black woman, personally, I'm not sure where the black men are. And I think the EDL riots became the physical side of this social activism. And I thought that's the first time I was like, well, the men have to go forward and protect the cities and protect the things. But it did make me feel like that was one of the times I was like, actually, are the men, is there something about social activism and feminism, not feminism, or like being a woman that is more appealing than it is to men? I don't know, but it would be interesting to see, do you, do you feel like when you look around at your comrades and stuff, do you feel like it's heavily <laughs> women or do you think it's like actually men need to get involved? Uh, it's interesting. I think historically, I think if you actually look on the ground, it's always mostly been women. 
honestly, like Black Power movement, even like in America, sixty percent of the Black Panthers are women. Half the Universal Negro Premier Association, Gavi, was women. Women is always women kind of running things, and then you have these kind of men at the top who are the mouthpiece. And I think what you're seeing now is you're seeing the women, which is a good thing, right? Like women are there, and you're seeing them. But I do think. I don't know. It does seem like not all black men, because certainly there's some people. I'm struggling to think of some people, but like a Carla's at, you know, you got like, like a Carla, George, Name five. Poet. Name five. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> not you. And not, not me. you. Carla, George the Poet. And what's that guy on Instagram? Who else forget his name? You get, you get a point for knowing his name. <laughs> what's that guy? I can see his face. I can say Shakabuzz. Shakabuzz. I don't think he's. Oh, he's a controversial. I don't know much about You know, it's, I'm, I'm aware of him. <laughs> I don't know if he's your best friend or close friend. I don't know. I don't know him too. I just spoke to him. I just know of him. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I'm not sure how people take him. And I've seen a lot. Of, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I would say this is not an endorsement list. It's just a, just a... <laughs> list. <laughs> do, they have to be, do they have to be British? Because if they have to be British, I'll kind of write it. Yeah. 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 He's, Br- he's British. So he, is he British? No. He's British. Do they have he's to, British, this has to be a list of five British, British people? Yeah. Oh, there's a guy I met the other day in, in BLM. Can't remember his name. Oh, so you met him once and you put him on your list. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed like he was doing good work. I don't know. Oh, no. Sha- um, Shakara down in London. I think three and a half. I think you've done three and a half. I did know, at least four. <laughs> at least yeah, four. four. Four is great. And how many but women? How many women could I have my name? I don't know. I mean, you, know you, you name five women did. Uh, Who are doing things, activism. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Women. Um... Obviously, there's a like we got we got a few. We've got likes of Kalechi. Hmm. Um we have um well that's a good point. And there's just so many. I don't even know how to how to articulate. We've got people like um, do you know Paulette and those from um Leading Roots, mm-hmm. different ways they're doing that work. Um we've also got who else is there? You're right. But these are not famous people, so it doesn't have to be famous, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're just talking about underground people. Then. Yeah, you're on the ground. There's so many. Like, there's all the people from like um, the Africa Centre. They're doing great work uh, yeah. on the ground there. We've got obviously, um, who else is there? There's so. I think there's just so many. But I, they're not black famous, so studies. Women, um, there's loads of people. There's like, I mean, there are a lot of women. Yeah, it's there true. are a lot of women who are not high profile. I think that's what I'm trying to look at. Like, not high profile, but no, just problem. people who are on the ground. Um, there's so many people organising. I did some stuff with London for Sudan. It feels like an all-woman um, team. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of women on the ground doing a lot of stuff. And I'm going to regret not re- saying their names, but they know who they are. But, yeah. yeah. I would say there's definitely more women. But there's also men. I just can't think of anybody. So I'm old and tired. So I'm no, going to say, no. <laughs> if I didn't I name you in the list. If I didn't say five, I'll allow you this time. <laughs> <laughs> but I know. But I do think there is a, there is a, who are the high pro, like high profile activists. There's not that many, generally. Just, oh, one of my close friends, Temi Mwale. Oh, yeah, Temi, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, Temi's yeah. doing her thing. There's Temi so works for Staff- Stafford Scott. There you go. There's a name, Stafford Scott. Stafford, okay. Um, London Monitoring Group. Okay, cool. That's definitely five, right? Maybe. Yeah. Gus John. Gus John. I saw Gus John the other day. He was in court. Oh, okay. Do some stuff. But no, but on the point, you're right. There is way more women on the ground. And yeah. I think two things happened. One is... Two things happened. One is there's been, unfortunately, I think there has been in some circles, not all circles, mm. a backlash against activism from men from a very problematic gendered perspective. Mm. Like Kim Crenshaw, one of my mentors, has a whole Say Her Name campaign because mm. black women are kind of cut out from the police violence thing, which wouldn't happen in the past, certainly, but has become a thing. So I think there is a bit of a, I don't know, resentment is not the right word, but there's certainly a bit of a, you know, a black woman thing is not really for us. And then maybe there's been a not for a lot, not all black members. Certainly, there has been a retreat, like a moving away from a similar activism, which is a problem. I um, on, on the on the men's side, obviously not speaking for all men, just for the disclaimer. From what from what you've seen, what was happening on the other side that would make men with, with, withdraw? It, let's speak hypothetically. Obviously, these are not necessarily diagnosis, but what are the kind of factors that you think would make men withdraw from activism? And my the the line of questioning is because it's for me to understand maybe how even my work can engage maybe more men or at least understand the context for which they are operating in and be like, actually, maybe the activism might not manifest in the same way, but we need to give them specific things to do. And then it's like, okay, great. Um, so just, yeah, because I, I guess it is getting on that line of like resentment 
from different genders. Um, yeah, there's certainly been a split, I and mean, the gender split mm. has definitely been there. Mm. And partly that was necessary. So if you look at back in the day, the misogyny, not even back in the day, look at now, the misogyny, the idea there's particular roles for women, et cetera, et cetera. And the women coming out and saying, nah, look, mm. that we have to have our own space, which is important, 100%. Um, and I think one of the backlashes you then have that from some men, I ain't saying all men, and certainly not me, is that, well, actually, now it's a woman thing. Where, where are the men? The men are being attacked. Why are you not talking about men? I hear that from a lot of people. I hear that sentiment from a lot of people. Mm. Like, why, why, why are we just focusing on women now? Why are we not focusing on men? Mm. Which I think has put has put some men off, unfortunately. Not seeing it's a bigger, bigger problem, bigger issue. Oh, so it's put them off that we are talking about women more. <laughs> yeah, that's enough really? to put them off. Yeah. Is, is, I don't, you know what? Is there fragility come, uh, attached to like the male ego in this way? Or is it generally like there's a way that women or society is talking about women that is unintentionally rubbing men the wrong way that we as our society needs to go, actually we're, we're doing the right thing, but we are penalizing or demonizing men rather than being like, actually, this is how, this is, this is, this is another way to do things. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a complicated one. I think it's a, one there is a fragility certainly. So mm. if you think about masculinity and black masculinity in particular, mm. it's unfortunately been heavily framed by racism. By you know the, the idea you're super, you have to be physically super, you have to be superior physically you have to be superior sexually, you have to be superior. All this kind of hyper masculinity has kind of been mm. heavily how black masculinity unfortunately defined. And we've taken it on board. If you listen to the music, listen to the culture, that is unfortunately one of the things we've taken on board. So then the idea that then we stop talking about men, mm. that becomes very fragile. So like, hang on a second, why, why, why? Like we're the center of it. Mm. So there is a fragility to it. I also think, and you know, I even say this, I don't want to get in trouble saying it, but, but it's, it's a bit about this. <laughs> say it. There are some ways in which some black women talk about black men, which are also are not very helpful. Mm. Right, so... Actually, this starts in America back in the day. The black, what's her, Michelle? You know, my, I can't remember nothing today. The book's called right. The Black, The Black Macho and the Myth of the Black Superwoman. Mm, okay. And it's kind of one of the first, I want to say black feminist texts, but it's one of the first popular texts by black women. And it really draws on all these negative stereotypes of black men, like black men are having masculine, black men are this, black men are the problem, black men are this. this, this. And there has been this thing where, for some black women, black men are the problem. And I talked about it as being a problem. Mm. And then obviously that's rightly gonna alienate. alienate mm. So I think it's a combination of two, I'd say. Do you think it's do you think it's a problem enough that we need to address it? Or do you think it's one of those ones where even outside the black community, these are just the trends between women and men that are happening, and obviously black people are gonna fall into that as well. Just like the incel culture, that type of like violence against if there's a if there's an increase or at least a recorded increase or violence against women or femicide then of course that will man that will also be the same in the black community or do you think it's something specific to the black community where it's like it's a problem and let's address it i think it's been overplayed how much it is a problem in the black community so yeah, like overplayed. yeah i think it's a, like i said that's a gender problem right <laughs> like i'm sure if you talk yeah. to white white men they say the same thing mm. like um there was one book i won't name names yeah, I'm not going to do it. Anyway, there's one, one, one activist say, black, black American would say she left the Black Panthers. So yeah. she went in there and it was really masculine yeah. and she didn't like getting hit on. Mm -hmm. So she went to like to the equivalent of the Socialist Workers Party in America. Right. And I'm like, there's no way you weren't getting hit on. And there's no way it wasn't exactly the same dynamic. Yeah, 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 in that yeah, we know yeah. they're, they're terrible with their misogyny. Yeah, 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 yeah. But somehow she framed that as our oh, black men are problematic. Mm. I'm sure white men are just as problematic. So I think partly we're overplaying. Overplaying it, but then I have masculinity being such a part of black masculinity, there is also probably something specific to that as well. Um, mm. I mean, the story that Kim Crenshaw tells me, where she actually has a book, um, I don't know, say her name, and she puts it in that book as well. You know, she they have this say they have the say her name protest. At, um, I think it's Mike Brand. It might have been Eric Garner. One of the Black Lives Matter protests, anyway. Mm. They they take say her name banners. And some people are proper like telling them to leave. Like, this is not for you. Why are you talking about the women? So it has, when that's happening, you know something bad. Something's broken quite significantly. That does need to be addressed. That's mm. Do you think, this is now an interview for you, so welcome <laughs> to my show. Um, <laughs> welcome to my podcast. Um, do you think we are 
equipped to address the challenges facing the black community. We as in, if you look at, quote, the state of activism, black activism right now, and obviously we, we don't need to name all the people that we feel like we are walking shoulders with and who are part of this, but looking at the people around you now and looking at the fight that is ahead, do you think we can rise to that challenge? Uh, <laughs> you have to believe you can, or what's the point? Mm. Mm-hmm. But if I'm being honest, do we, are we in a position? Let's <laughs> 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 see this as a yearly review, 2024. <laughs> Before we get 2025, do you know what I mean? Are we equipped? Like, like, do we have what it's, do we have the information? Do we have, the, as you said, the intent, the desire, the hope? Do we have the focus, the discipline, the, 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 the harmony? The bare minimum harmony required. We can have our differences as men and women, that's fine. But as in, when we walk forward, can we go for this moment? Let's just do our bit. Honestly, right now, we don't. There's a Dead Prez. I don't even know if Dead Prez. That's an old hip-hop group that mm. people probably don't even know. But anyway, there's a Dead Prez song and there's a line that says, niggas ain't ready for evolution. Mm. And that's just a reality. Like, we're not. So, we're not. Yeah. There's not. But it no. doesn't mean we can't be, right? Like, we can be. It's, it just, But that's why... We have to, but we have to accept that we're not as well. I think actually understanding that we're not, that we don't, we're not in a place mm. of black liberation at all. And so the question is, and how do you get to that place? What do we need to do mm. in order to build that space, which does involve gender, bringing that back together, or back together, together, does involve yeah. generational stuff as well. So the bigger generational gaps. Um, Sorry. International gaps as well. Global gaps. Yeah. All these gaps, all these gaps, there's massive gaps. We're just, we're just split in many, many ways. So how do you bring it together? That's, the question. That's what I see online a lot. I'm not on Twitter because I believe that no one should be on Twitter. No one with a gumption should be on Twitter unless you're using it literally strictly like as a promote, promote, talk and go. Yeah. But it's a really, I think it's a really difficult place to um, revive and to clean up. Um, but on Twitter, I hear from my friends that there's a lot of like the diaspora wars. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Although there could be jest in who makes the better this and that, or who knows the, the, the there's people are really arguing about people not knowing where they come from, and that being something that's that's a line of like to berate them with. But at the same time, people are using like people living in the African continent or the Caribbean as a way to be like you're from a poor continent, or so you just you just can't imagine that. How can this movement fight for liberation on all counts? Yet we're using it to like demonize each other but i just i just don't know how we got to that point where we're literally looking at like especially african-americans because i think we, a lot of us grew up with african-american influence right tv yeah. the histories that a lot of it that can inspire movements around the world so to get to a place where it's kind of like we see them as other is interesting outside of recognizing and appreciating there is a difference in our experiences i think there's an attempt there to be like we are black but that journey that experience that exposure can sometimes manifest itself very differently. And I think that's important to recognize, but I think that separatist type of thing mm. doesn't look healthy for the future. I don't know. You heard of um, FBA, Foundational Black Americans? Mm. Foundational? Foundational Black Americans. Uh, there's a book, I've got the book somewhere here. Because I remember uh, at Club, in Clubhouse days, one thing that shocked me was that they used to call them, they, they called themselves, and I, this is not a critique, this is more like, I just didn't know this is what they do, um, descendants of chattel slavery. Okay. Oh, yeah. of chattel slavery. Yeah, that's Adios, right? Adios. Adios. And yeah, I yeah. didn't know that was something that that you would use. But even thinking about maybe the N word and stuff like that, I see how you could turn something into more of a positive identity or identity that you can identify with at least to control it. But I was really, I was really like taken aback, and I think a lot of British people were like, "Oh, I didn't know you call yourself Afri- African descendants of chattel slavery." American? They don't say African. Yeah, well, <laughs> they don't, they don't see themselves as African. African. <laughs> yeah. Ados, um, and in the new one from Terry, yes, Ados, Tariq yes. Nasheed, foundational Black American. Um, and to be a foundational Black American, you have to be you have to be able to prove you have a ancestor who was enslaved in 1865 in America. Otherwise, you're not an, F- an FBA. And then what what are you? Your cast to the side. <laughs> so you can be half half. I'm still laughing, don't You could be half FBA if you have one parent who's foundational and one who's yeah. not. And then if you don't, if you're from the Caribbean or Africa, you're just not, you're you're just not, not, not in a group. That's interesting. That's interesting. And I, and I honestly, for them, if that were, obviously we all grew up differently in it. And I guess that's some people looking at us like Black British and stuff is a weird name to kind of adopt in some ways. Do you say Black but, British? Would you say you were Black British? 
I, you know what it is? It depends on the audience because I just feel like whichever way I'm going to upset somebody. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I'm just upsetting someone. It's, if I, say, I say I'm black British to, 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 to highlight the fact that I did not, I was not brought up on the continent. Yeah. There's a cultural exposure experience I do not have that, that I read the same way everyone else read it in their book. However, if you're black here, it symbolizes or signals that you have you come from a different heritage anyway your parents come from somewhere else so that then allows people to ask me oh where are your parents or whatever question they're gonna ask and i'll be like oh i'm nigerian my my ethnicity is that i'm nigerian so um but yeah i'll say black i think black i think black british is really it's quite a popular thing here oh it's, it's a massive thing. it wasn't but, a thing when i was young um actually when i was young it was caribbean or you the caribbean or african basically mm. it seems like it's not as big a deal now maybe what, to call yourself black british well, the Caribbean African thing doesn't seem to be as big a. No, even the, the 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 day it becomes a really big thing is Carnival. That's the day I remember. <laughs> that day I'm offline. In fact, I'm in Carnival. Do you know what I mean? So, but that was that's another thing that I just I haven't got into that kind of topic. But it, again, it seems like a really big thing in terms of being like, what do you do now with the modern black society that majority of them aren't Caribbean, but because of the history of the country and the roots and the foundations that Caribbean people have built in the country, we are now utilizing that or participating in that. And we haven't agreed that terms of participation. It felt like just being black was enough. And now yeah. there's terms of participation that I think a lot of African people don't like. They don't like to qualify. They don't like to take those like, you know, because you feel like, why not? I don't like that. I, like, is it, it's like a white person telling us, but then there's a respect thing that you have to enter and go, there's a respect there. There's a culture that exists. It doesn't mean I'm not black. It just means I have to respect the culture. Um, and in the other way, sometimes it can feel sometimes a bit like anti-African, you know, because sometimes it's like, oh, it's not us that's playing the music. It's actually Caribbean people playing Afrobeats at Carnival. <laughs> so sometimes it's like, I'm not sure who is, who. do you know what I mean? Like who is the one doing it wrong? But I can obviously imagine that when it started, of course it was more like, you know, soca and a dance hall and stuff like that. And, um, and I, and I and I think anyone who, you know, identifies with a culture and stuff like that, I just believe it's for them to determine the terms of it. And I think- yeah, but come on, the, the whole thing with the whole point of carnival, the reason we celebrate carnival mm. in the Caribbean is to connect back to Africa. That's why we celebrate. That was mm. the point of it. That's where it comes from. So mm. why would you be cutting African people out of the thing which is connected us back to Africa? That's the whole point of it. <laughs> But this is where I am on the internet. I'm like, I don't speak about it. And I've told people, even though I'm, not spe- I'm speaking about it now, saying I'm not speaking about it, which is, I guess, a cheat code. It's like, <laughs> it's like I wasn't sure. I thought, aren't we? We're all Africans, right? Okay, cool. Yeah. And then I was like, but you have your own culture, just as I wouldn't go to a Congolese event and be like, well, Nigerians would do it this way. Or like, do you know what I mean? I get there's still different cultures within culture. But it is getting to a kind of a scary place, I think, from what I hear that we are now... I don't know, it's kind of like a form of, not segregation, but something that join everyone together, given the numbers, you know, given the histories of migration here, mm. it feels as though we need to take a step back and go, actually, what's the fundamentals here? What, what do we need to protect? Who do we need to listen to? Because at the end of the day, I'm not Caribbean, so I, my voice should not be centered the conversation anyway. Mm. But at the same time, on the ground, we've all mixed. It's only on that carnival day that we remember that I'm not Car- I'm not Car- Jamaican. <laughs> I thought I was <laughs> this whole time. <laughs> and then I'm kind of like, yeah, I can't wear my Nigerian t-shirt to carnival. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, good. I already annoyed Jamaicans, so I probably shouldn't annoy them anymore. But, you know, my family's Caribbean. Oh, okay. Because, you know, I said the whole thing, like Jamaica, like, oh, and this isn't even just a Jamaica specific. All these colonies, Nigeria included, mm. they're made up European things. And we defend them, defend them, defend them. But why are we defending them? No man knows it. Mm. Right? Um, so, yeah, on the podcast a couple of, few weeks ago, Mm. I just pointed out Marcus Garvey is probably correct that the solution to Jamaica is to leave Jamaica and, and go back to the continent, yeah. right? Long term. People didn't like it. But on this one, what's actually happened in Britain is when we think about Black Britishness, it's historically been Caribbean. Mm. And now, obviously, there's more um, direct from Africa than Caribbean, so it's, it's, it's shifting. Mm. And we don't like that. We have to be honest. Caribbean people don't like that. We don't like that we're no longer dominant. Yeah. Jamaica's no longer dominant. And there's a shift, and we're kind of feel like we're losing something in that shift. And not really embracing the fact that it's not really losing anything. You're gaining, yeah. There's a fear. It def- there's definitely a, it definitely comes from a place of fear, which is why I understand it. And I can imagine, especially if you act like it's not happening, the outcome of this could go so left that by the time it's in ten years' time, it's now a Spanish 
or like a Portuguese or Italian event. Do you know what I mean? Because you're brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. It can start black and it can start Caribbean. And before yeah. you know it, do you know what I mean? It's a all lives matter type of <laughs> core concept. And I get that. That's why I get, I get why they protect it. But I think, as you said, change doesn't always have to be negative. It's a new way to embrace things. Um, but once I guess once we're bridled by fear, this is what happens. And it's a lot of the young people online talking about this as well. Young people, anyone I would say, literally under 40, like just people who like, I think there's a lot of young people there who are very much like trying to piece together the history and their modern day. And I think there's a disconnect. And so that's where that thing is happening on top of the fact that it's taking place on Twitter. Yeah. So you've got the combination for the worst. It don't help. But part, I mean, part of it is the nation, the, the, the idea of being national. Mm. But it's the thing, the whole black British thing, foundation of black American, or even embracing like, I really want to, really want to be Jamaican or really, really want to be Nigerian. Mm. It's just a trap. It's a trip, but like, mm. that's not that's not where we should be. We should be saying, look, black is all of us. Mm. And how do we build all of us? But it seems like we're going the opposite direction and we're trying mm. to narrow it down to be very specific mm. to whatever we think. We if, if you were to plan society for black British people, not to say that we'll be segregated from other people, apart from obviously the, 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 the attempt from gentrification to separate us, but let's just say not. <laughs> um, what is your ideal like society? How are people inter interacting? So, example, how does the schools interact with their healthcare service or like maybe the, the estates? Like, what, what does that look like? Not your final picture, obviously. I think it's a lifelong journey to the villa, but I think we need to start understanding practice. How do these things interact? Like, what, what in this country, on these island, this island? Yeah, on this island. Like, what, what? What so I'd say like? segregation, like residential segregation is not a bad thing. I don't, the idea that we should be trying to integrate that into the, that's a mistake. Mm. We could very, you know, like certain parts of London, certain parts of Birmingham, we should be strongholds. How do you protect yourself? How do you control the schools? How do you control like the local area? That's, that's, that's what we should that's be doing. Cool. I'm doing the opposite. Really? That's, that's the only way you can protect yourself. Only so one day we should, we should expect you in the middle of London with a flag going, <laughs> all the who identify as black follow me. <laughs> Come live right here. This Are you leading us to green, yeah, you're leading us to green pastures. <laughs> this is crazy. But no, but realistically, if you look at any successful minority group in a Western country, and even white groups, mm. they use residential segregation first. Like, they let's take a white group, Italians in America. When they go to when they go to America first, massively discriminated against. They all live in the same place, little Italy. They work together, they build each other up. You know, the mafia as well. Like, so but they got like a whole Literally, this is a massive place where they're all working together. Mm. Then they're successful, and they all they all leave, right? Mm. They don't leave before they're successful, and they wouldn't have been successful had they not been together. True. We're doing the opposite thing. We're like we come here, with, let's, let's integrate, integrate, integrate without actually solving the problem. Yeah, nobody knows it. Yeah, and then you spoke about like international, um, the international aspect or the gaps in the movement as well, or the like, in terms of Congo and Sudan as well. Like what role, you know, what role does Black Britain play in these like international crimes against humanity, <laughs> this, this imperialism? Because I think there's there's this one thing that I think that we also need to come to terms with. We are discriminated against. We are oppressed in, if we're a minority group, let's say in the UK, let's use that specifically, but let's say the West, right? We are yeah. oppressed here, very real, cool. We are also now part of the imperialist project because mm -hmm. we reside here. So our actions yeah. unintentionally, whatever are complicit mm -hmm. with the European project, the British project. So yeah. we are also the days we are talking about. It's just that we're not making the decisions, right? Unless you actively go against it and try to dismantle it. Yeah. So using that, what is our role when it comes to advocating for Congo, Sudan, as examples of international, the international oppression or overseas oppression of black communities? That's the biggest problem we have now is that we've, like if I got I got to go police interview for calling Calvin Robinson a house Negro, <laughs> but to be honest, we're all house Negroes over here. Like mm. the, the division now between house and field isn't middle class black people, uh, working class black people. It's if you're in Britain, you're it, you're privileged. Even if you're at the bottom, and we have to accept we even though we're getting massively discriminated against, mm. the conditions of the poorest person here are nothing like the conditions of the poorest. Like I went to Nigeria a few years ago. Mm. There's no comparison. Honestly, <laughs> you cannot. They do 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 not compare, right? And so, and we also have to then acknowledge that the that relative privilege that we have, and some of us are very privileged. So I'm very, very, very privileged in that. Mm. It's exactly it's because of the oppression of Congo in particular. I mean, 
look at how we'd be having this whole conversation on my lovely laptop and all that, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's, and if we can't accept that, we're part of the problem. That's the first thing is accepting we're part of the problem. That our hands are as bloody as any white person's hands. And it made, most white people don't make the decisions. They're just in the society, right? Mm. So it can't be enough to say advocate and like just point it out. You know, yeah. point it out on Twitter with your mobile phone, <laughs> with, the, with the minerals, yeah. some kid in the Congo put in your phone. Oh, yeah, eyes on Congo. Mm. That, that is not... That is not enough. That's just, I'd say that's making it worse. Making it worse. So maybe we need to go back to really laying the foundations of how we, how we, what we perceive the problems to be. I think naturally, obviously, you will see certain problems, respond to them and keep going. But I think we, there's no perception, the globalized perception, which is not an, then allowing us to understand, as you said, A, the privileges we have in this country, regardless of how it's stratified. B, how much our, privileges give us an opportunity to advocate for others in their absence because again not just part of the british project but the but the capitalist project right and therefore there's no there's no one to really ask to stop to stop it's literally our consumption habits habits and i think that's what makes congo in particular a very challenging um genocide to address and articulate amongst black people because there's who, who, who we'll be going to number 10 which you obviously we will do all these things because you know but really and truly the demand for cobalt and all these things would probably at least to a degree so i think that's another thing as well i think there's that thing of capitalism i know everyone hates talking about capitalism but i'm like that's why that's why it's so um it's such a sustained type of oppression because we don't address capitalism it's we do everything around capitalism to make capitalism work <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, but capitalism, by its definition, said it's going to trickle down. Yeah. So, why are we upset that there's poor people or genocidal issues? But capitalism says this is part of our package. It will trickle down one day. Now, that day might be in fact twenty years time, a thousand years time. But one day, Africa will realize its potential, right? Because Africa's had potential since the beginning of time. Mm. And so we're still waiting for Africa's potential to manifest, right? So yeah, it's, it's like, never going to happen. But it can't. It can't happen. Africa cannot be anything other than poor under capitalism. That's just the reality of it. But do you? Would you? From your perception of what who you, and how you, and people that you've met who are black, let's say black British particularly, do you feel like they recognise the role of capitalism? Do they? Do they think capitalism is even different from economics? I think they teach us capitalism in schools and not economics because when they bring in Marx. It's like, oh, Marx, they do this whole thing of like, you know, Marx was the guy who was this. Before you even learn about what he said, you don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> if they paint how they used to paint Jeremy Corbyn yeah. sitting on a train or some man who was just, you know, yeah, just yeah, some yeah. Just wanderer who maybe escaped from some somewhere where you're like, are you all right? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so they do that. And then they tell you, but this is why it didn't work because of like four, three case studies on, on, on three dictators who were dictators before they were communists and actually never adhered to communism, wherever it is. Yeah, but yeah. capitalism has shown it's failed time and time again, but yet we still embrace the wins because we have now an iPhone 16 or I don't know, they built something or I don't know. So it's so interesting how I think black, I think black people need to uncouple themselves from capitalism. I think that's one of the biggest things that's killing us actually. Oh, well, yeah. but how, how do you do it though? That's a problem because everything's... You're in the classroom. So how, do, how, have, you, how have you tried? <laughs> you can, the problem is because we get taught, the, we don't get taught. Education is not education, it's propaganda. Like you just get taught the things. Nation state is a real thing. Um, capitalism is the only way forward. Mm. And we buy, we lapped it up. Like the biggest neo colonialism is African students, Caribbean students coming to the to Britain to learn about like development and economics. They're literally just teaching you how to mash up in the country. Like, that's the whole person of development studies. I know. So it's we just need to. It's you have to really do everything again. But when you say that, everybody says, well, that's not possible. It's too much. Blah, blah, blah. But there's no other solution. We have to be building things outside of this because there's no other solution to this problem. So 2025 priorities for the for community building, you would say, what is it? Like, so, what do we need to do to get to that place where we start doing something that we can go, okay, at least we are, we are, we are pushing the needle. It might not be our generation that ends it, but we are moving the needle. There must be something that we can be like, okay, guys, this is the focus this year. Let's just, some people are talking about, I went on a podcast the other day and it was kind of like, someone mentioned like a, a black party mm -hmm. in the UK, a political party, just, just to, just to be a protest party, just like kind of like the green party was just to be like, 
But obviously there's pros and cons now. Other parties will feel like, oh, they've, they've addressed those issues. So if you want to vote for them, vote for them. They're never going to get in, but vote for them. Now yeah. we can really stand strong in our everyone hates black people, everyone hates brown people <laughs> thing agenda. Do you know what I mean? Because this year there was not one thing for black people. I'm so shocked this year. Normally they give us a little something. Did they visit the churches? They do the night vigil. They do something. <laughs> they but did that in 2020. 2020. I have the pastor once. Not one pastor asked us to do double double offering. <laughs> For the, do you know what I mean? It, we just said, you know, we're not on the agenda no more. So, yeah. So maybe 2020 is a long time ago. 2020 is a long time ago, man. Happy. I know the money's done. It was such, a, it was such an interesting time. Um, <coughs> we didn't make enough yeah. of it. We didn't make enough of it. We could have got way more rep reparations. In no, no, we should have, we should have milked it. <laughs> and the thing is that, that we can't even milk it because it's actually real. Like, yeah. there's nothing we're gonna say that's an exaggeration. Like, exactly. there's nothing we can actually exaggerate. So, um. But, um, so, yeah. but it was 2025. So uh, we organized Convention of African People, Gambia 2025. Malcolm X's 100th birthday. Um, and what we're saying is, look, we have to build internationally. Because we tried to, so around the organization of Black Unity, that's what funds all this. Mm. Um, we tried to build it locally first. Mm. But it don't really work because you just get stuck in British stuff. Mm. So what we so for Malcolm's birthday, we're having Convention of African People in Gambia, inviting anybody to come. Britain around the world. I want to come. So, definitely invited. Definitely invited. Come, like, because that's. I have to say, I'm, I'm fortunate again, being privileged to have traveled a lot and seen, spoke to black people in all parts of the world. Mm. When you talk to people, it's exactly the same problem. Honestly, like, what do you? You just go. It's the same. There's different. Like, looks a bit different somehow, but it's the same. And I think bringing us together on that level is really, really important to get people to start thinking beyond Britain, beyond Jamaica, beyond Nigeria, beyond like what as black people. How do we globally come together? Because that's the only solution. Only that has been. Mm, so you think we need a global movement? It has to be global. That, that, man, that, that, that has local activities, but it's a global movement. Yeah, so what we're trying to do with the organisation is chapters in different parts. So you have a different chapter, Birmingham, London, Kinshasa, Kingston. So it's doing the local stuff, but actually it's a global organisation. Mm. That's what we need. It sounds mm. a bit pie in the sky, but who knows? <laughs> try, 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 try it and would see what happens. Would there be a women's branch? You know, it's interesting that we had these discussions within organization and it's, mm. do you need a women's branch or do you need to make sure that all the branches are properly intersectional? Mm. And that's that's the question, which hasn't been resolved to be fair. We see. Come bring people together and see see where we go. Let's see what happens. Um, so have you... Next year is not the first time we will take that trip. You'll have more trips. Like, have so, you done more trips in the past? Uh, so this is the first time we've done it like this. Uh, and oh, to be okay. honest, I got some money. I, I'm doing a Malcolm X book for next year yeah uh, no, i think i think i think maybe he shouldn't have told me but i think nels said you were working on something yeah malcolm x book which might get me in prison given the fact i'm getting really? <laughs> as negro if has negroes I might, I might really have to get arrested right I'm, now it's the easiest time to get to prison Trust yeah no, yeah. So if you want to write your part two yeah and, right because that would be your best work trust me <laughs> yeah, be prison, prison diaries isn't it That'll yeah be, do you know what i mean do you know what yeah, i mean yeah. But uh, we had Malcolm X book coming out, but I took the money from the Malcolm X book to uh, fund yeah. this Gambia thing. Oh, wow. So it very much is a start. Let's see what happens. Mm. Ten people turn up, ten people turn up. Well, let's, I'm hoping it'll be a lot bigger than it. And then we'll take it from there. But, so how, how, do you, how do you see yourself in the, I guess, Black liberation movement? Like, how, Do you have a perception of yourself like, I am a leader or am I a, one of many voices or... Do I have a unique perspective or I have a certain ambition? Not in like a self-serving way, but in like a, I really think that we need to address this particular issue and I can keep it on the agenda. Like, how, do you have a perception of yourself within the movement? No, not really. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I just do stuff. <laughs> See what happens. On a real level, I just, do, I just say, look, this needs, This seems like it's a good idea. Yeah. Let's see what happens. And, yeah. and what's, your, how, what's, your, what's your thoughts on like visible, collaborating with visible people, like influencers and stuff or other black individuals who are not well known for their activism but obviously because of the way capitalism works and that stuff they have a visibility that's rooted in somewhere else do you do you ever get like a thought of hmm there's a better way we could use our visibility or do you see it as you know what every group of people are going to have people who are just not necessarily contributing to the welfare of their people <laughs> so we're not unique in that way we should be allowed to also have people who are just doing whatever or do you feel like there is an obligation for the black community to be like yeah, we should be able to have all these things. That's part of what we're fighting for is to be, quote, unquote, mediocre or to be normal or have dreams that everyone else has that isn't linked to liberation. But because of our context, 
do you feel like there should always be a contextual duty that we always try and honour? You know, I think that do no harm is important. So I think if you're in, if you're a celebrity and you got a big, you shouldn't be doing any harm. And I think you should get called. If you do harm, you should get called out. Mm. Outside of that, it's kind of like with young people. I don't know you can blame people if the politics isn't there. So like mm. well, before, when you had a strong political movement, mm. people didn't really have a choice but, but to be more on it like because mm. the movement was there. And then when the movement's not there, people can kind of slip. But you can't really blame them because how would they know, right? Mm. So unless someone's like egregious, like properly anti-black and just doing damage, I would usually just, eh, yeah. so, not my so, business. So what's your thoughts on someone like P. Diddy? Oh, God, what about doing harm? Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no. Sorry, <laughs> let me be specific because there's many ways. <laughs> there is harm that this person is undoubtedly like, as far as my eyes can see and, you know what I mean? Of course, but in terms of like, now specifically, not the direct victims, but the actual concept of black success. Yeah. And, yeah. and falling from pedestals and duties and that role model stuff. Like, when, when do you not think people like P. Diddy have an impact on, on, on how people perceive us or even our progress moving forward? Would there, would there ever be anyone who the powers that be allow, you know, to get that comfortable in their success to the point where they can seem like a, some sort of leader in some way? Do you think now he's kind of ruined that for everyone? I think the problem with Diddy is not because even before the all the all the crimes, the actual actual crimes were seen, um, you could make the case it was cooning anyway. Right? You could make the case it was all the all the, most of the music's not particularly yeah. positive and dissolving. Yeah. Um, and is that model of success what you really want? Like even my son telling me I want to be a billionaire. Well, why would you want to be a billionaire? Like, what, yeah, what, what ambition is this? <laughs> Listen, he's seen inflation and said, listen, <laughs> yeah. I need to be a billionaire just to look after you. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Because when you're writing your Malcolm X part three, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You yeah. going to fund the rest of the family. <laughs> but like, now you appreciate why it'd be a billionaire. Do you know what I mean? You need a billionaire, do you know what I mean? Yeah, ethical. Yeah. Ethical yeah. billionaire. Yeah, uh, no. But no, but if you look at that model of success that we've been sold for hip-hop generally, and Diddy's a perfect example of this, it's, ne- it's terrible. Oh my God, it's so bad. Mm. But again... For me, that's not a him problem. Do you do you like not mm-hmm. the criminal part, part of it? Don't do that. Yeah, but, um, the problem is that we as a community are looking up to that and going, This is a good idea. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, what that's that's our fault. Mm-hmm. People want to coon their way to making money, that's fine. But as we're looking to them for leadership, that's where we went wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, you can I can enjoy the music and go, like, I enjoy some terrible music, but I understand it's terrible. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not looking at DMX as a robot, though, you know, it's just music in the gym but mm. as a community we've just kind of because we because we don't have other visible leaders we just kind of accept these really really problematic people mm. like diddy and now diddy showing how pro- just how problematic how, <laughs> how problematic he is but he was always problematic from the day to be honest because people say that like obviously you can't be what you can't see you know the social media media in general representation stereotypes all that stuff has a negative impact on whichever demographic that is being misrepresented yet i never know what people believe the solution to that is other than giving parents so much more like responsibility to be like wrap your child up no no phones after 1 p.m do you know what i mean like you can use this laptop for 30 minutes and parent control here parent control there and whatever it is, what, what do we do about the social media thing? Or not the social media in general, what do we do? We know we know there is a problem, regardless of the intent, yet we just, I feel like we haven't, after all this time, developed some sort of like counter, you know, counter movement, at least, especially for our young people who are so much more vulnerable, I would say, mm-hmm. because obviously age, because of just how consistent that representation is across yeah, yeah. And as you said, the positive role models are not visible or in jobs that we have associated with success. And then the weight of that whole potentially I'm a descendant of somewhere. I don't come from here. So there's an immigrant desire to also better your family. And that might have to yeah. allow me to engage in more in the eye of the storm than I would like to. I, the privilege that we might have here is might be we can engage in, you know, student politics and politics and university. It's not easy, but there's still like a privilege to be able to you know, say something and, and it be printed in books and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Whereas other people are like, listen, my mum works night shifts. My dad was never at home. I went to a school that the teachers didn't even teach and my older brother's here or I was groomed by this man and this whatever. And they just, 
you know what, what are we i don't know sometimes i feel like what are we really what are we really doing to, with that this media representation stuff like i don't know yeah. no but that's again community education like what, what like there are like i know i'm fortunate to have had the education i had which was not in school <laughs> it was in hope mm-hmm. um and i think we've lost that for kids there's no black child should be able to should be coming out saying i didn't have the opportunity to learn about this. I didn't have the, mm. and we can't allow. That's the schools I'm going to do. We have to do ourselves, you know. Right? I think that's a, that's the community education. That's we have to make sure that all, all black kids are getting yeah. community education. But with your kids, you have more than one, two. I got four. Four. I got okay, you got four. Okay. Yeah. But with them, maybe I do need to be a billionaire. Maybe that's huh? maybe I do need to be a billionaire. Yeah, one of them needs to. There's always one kid that just you look at them and you go, you did learn nothing on the dinner table. But uh, you love them. Do you know what I mean? They'll be the one to bail you out. Um, but with your kids, if you don't mind me asking, what was your approach to community? Or at least like, because you're so obviously well read and you're involved in like the activism movement. How does it work when it's now a fact, you know, charity starts at home? How do you implement that in your own life? Or do you think you have? Or is there things that you want to do more of? Could probably do more, but I'd certainly say like they know stuff. Like they mm. like, we talk to them about stuff. They come to events. They all oh, nice. know who Malcolm X is and any of the Maroons are. Nice. They just know. They just know stuff. They know way way more stuff. But again, that's that's how I came up because my mum and dad were both Black Power yeah. activists. So I came up in it. So my kids are privileged in that sense. But yeah. we, I'd say, I haven't done enough. More generally, so community wide, right? It can't just be like your kids. What do you do with your kids? It has to be what we do with our kids. Right, how are we doing? How are we solving mm. that It's a community issue, right? Def- definitely a community issue. And when I was more in student politics, we talk more about like Saturday schools. Yeah, like, Saturday school. Yeah. Mm. Where, like, I'm wondering, is it just time? Is is it just time to bring that back now? Let's just let's just forget. It's time that every borough, at least, or every whatever area has. Obviously, if you're in London, the borough. But if you're not here, like every town or whatever has actually a functioning black Saturday school or some sort of school where they can go get that extra support, learn more about their histories and, you know, their rights and, you know, how to articulate themselves and all these other things that the school will not necessarily teach them or in the way that they need to be taught. Is is that something that we need to start doing more of? I know they still exist in some capacity and some, you know, sometimes people make makeshift stuff, but do you, can you see that in your 2025 yeah, I think certainly if we're talking about what can we do locally, Saturday school is a good one. Mm. You know, so it's an easy, not easy, no, it's an easy one. It just takes effort and time. Like, it's not hard to do. Like, when they did their first Saturday schools, nobody was qualified. They just said, yo, let's get a room. <laughs> Could yeah. get some kids in, you know what I mean? Yeah. How, like, how would you do it? If if I'm listening, because what you're saying, I'm thinking maybe, Kane Day saying I can do this. Let me, let me, maybe next week I just go to people and say, listen, five of us have you got kids let's just do a makeshift thing and do something but if it you think it really is as simple obviously i know like depends on the cost of the room you're going to use or where you live in that but do you think it's just about making sure that you you monitor and supervise the young people that are in your life in a way where you you, you just take interest in what they're learning because i think sometimes it's like it doesn't have to be a school in the sense of like strict lessons and it's so neat but it's the idea that people care about people's like like just intellect or people's understanding about society and i think we've we've, we've taken away our care from other people's kids and then i think now yeah. when it gets back to a point where it's like the parents are just one of many people that are looking after that child you know um so maybe do you, so the question is do you think how simple do you think it is to set this stuff up on a, even in a makeshift way what are the kind of like kind of small steps we can all take yeah, so like I said, like, the original, the first Saturday schools were in people's front rooms. Like, literally, like, just said, look, kids ain't learning nothing in the school. We're just, oh, I'm not a teacher, I don't know nothing, but I know they're not learning nothing in the schools. Mm. So I'm going to invite a handful of kids to my house, and we're going to work it through. Just say, like, what, mm. what do you think they should learn? And that's how Saturday school starts, really. And that's what it really is, people just doing that work. I think now we should have enough kind of... I think one of the problems is with black people generally is a lack of organization. Mm. So, you know, 60 years after the first Saturday school, we should have a bank of resources that people can use. So like, hey, here you go, here, do this, do that, do that. Here's some stuff. But it don't exist, unfortunately. So actually, you know what? I'm going to put it on priority number 2025. Let's create a bank of resources <laughs> that people can just go and use. I mean, it, can, it don't have to be nothing formal. Yeah. You can just bring your kids, just bring reading group. Just even, even if it's just, I'm going to read some different books to a group of kids and we're going to have a reading group and that's that. People think that you need all this. You don't need to jump all these routes. It's not. You can just do it. 
That's what we've I done think, in the past. We just did it. I think, it should, I think that it should be a 2025 goal. I personally believe that that is something that actually makes me feel good. Like, you know, you hear some ideas and you're like, I hear that idea, but I'm not best placed to even contribute. So I think it should go, but that's not where my thing lies. But I think maybe for myself and um, anyone else who's who has that kind of like relationship with education or love for it or certain experience in it, that's something that they feel like they can help use. And people have so many different skill sets that they can, they're all informative from the music, from the arts, from history, from politics. It's really, as you said, making resources and even things like this, like obviously they could, you can make, we can make 15 minute videos on a topic, just talking it through, you know what I mean? The conversation, and someone can sit there on their way to school and be like, oh yeah, I actually kind of get that now. Yeah, Cause yeah, someone yeah. had asked the question about actually, if M Mansa Musa was so great, why did he take over? Why did he colonize Spanish people? You know what I mean? Those might be questions that they might have and it might help them understand the greater context of things, but there's no one to dissect it. You know what I mean? Ask those questions other than the exam questions, which are name three reasons why the British Empire fell. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that is not, we, no one cares why it fell. Like it's not, it's, it hasn't fallen as well. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, it's still hasn't fallen. Or, yeah, that's not how it used to happen in history. They say something like, was King Henry VIII or something, something or a lover man? Like, was he an adulterer or a lover man? And it was like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, but that would only come from Britain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. about his personal life. <laughs> like, yeah. Nobody else did. I mean, I'm sure around the world we'll see all the other things he did. But do you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, yeah, I think you should do it. Let's do it. I said, come to it right there. Even video. Yes, yes, like, 100%. You know, let's think of it and let's do it because I think you'll be so great and. I think even around, you know, carnival time or Black History Month time or certain times in the season, the in-person stuff, you know, it doesn't have to be every week, but it's like it's like coordinating with all the other Black um, Saturday schools as well. You know what I mean? Maybe that's something for them to also have. They might already have it, but somewhere that they know that actually. Black on the Square. Did you have you been to Black on the Square? Black in the Square? Black on the Square? Black on the square. I went to the Brom one, but not in the London one. London one, yeah. So the London one, yeah, it's just like in Trafalgar Square and there's like tents and resources, but... It would be nice to have a session where people are learning something as well, activity for a young person. You know what I mean? To you know, there's so many different ways, um, and that's what I think one of my things is connecting that like education, politics with arts and culture and things that we love, yeah, but yeah, making yeah. it all holistic. I think we can be the greatest Afrobeat dance hall demographic in the world. It shouldn't be at the expense of us also knowing the history of us. I don't think we need to be so like. And that's where it's kind of getting for me. It's like only you either go to the parties or you know the history behind the parties. Like, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like no, no, like, you're right, you're right. No, I did so. And this thing about social media that it's also an opportunity. Like mm -hmm. I use social media all the time in a positive mm -hmm. way. There's mm -hmm. so much good stuff out there you can use. This is how we use it. How are we making sure we use it properly? Right? Shouldn't be scared of it. Just embrace it and use it the way it needs to be used. Definitely. Um, you know, Mel's, Mel's, Mel's. Um, they were like a student activist at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah, I, was yeah. I, I think they're doing their PhD at Cambridge or they just finished. I can't mm -hmm. remember, I need to follow up. Um, I know they had a big idea. I don't know if they're still working on it, but like the black university yeah. type of like space. What's your thoughts on black university in the UK? <laughs> it's never going to happen, so. Mm. And I'm not sure it's even a good thing. Okay. I think, if I'm honest, like, mm. if I could rewind... 15 years, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't be doing academia. Wouldn't have done it. Really? I've done community, community education. All these things I've said I've done, well, i just done them then. We'd be fine. We'd be in a much better situation. I have not done academia. I think. Wait, so you, oh, you think so, black people in Britain would be better off because you did not do it? <laughs> well, <I don't. laughs> because you took the wrong and that's path. That's how important I am. That's how important oh, I am. This is it now. Um, this is it. <laughs> no, no, when I say we, I don't mean all of us, we, but I've been, I certainly been in a better situation. Mm. But, uh, organization would be in a better situation. Mm, you know? really? And not just me, a lot of people, and I say be like, like just generally we put faith in these institutions. Mm. I just take your time, resources. It's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, like I said, if I could rewind, we'd have built a whole different organization that had different people in it, had different mm. Yeah, I think no, I said no, I start we would be in a better situation because we would yeah, have a much yeah. bigger platform. Yeah, yeah. To do the really important work that we don't have as much now. Not so, now. Do you think in the last couple of years, you've seen, following what you said, the power that social media or media platforms got to inform, which is better or more ideal than the traditional university settings. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Just, they're freely available. They reach more people. And the problem in now is it's the wrong people. <laughs> like, I remember when it was 2016, Dr. Umar came to to Brom. Mm. And I had no idea who, who the hell Dr. Umar. But oh, like really? I, yeah, but like I said, <laughs> when people came out, so mm. I was like, I'd never seen these people before, you know, having worked in Brom, done stuff in Brom, never seen thousands of young people came out. Yeah. I was like, wow, this man's got reach. Yeah. Because it's the wrong people. The tool's there. It's just yeah. the wrong people. It's just yeah, the wrong yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, room, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I was going to say, in your, so what was the title of the course that you were teaching at um, Birmingham? In Birmingham? Uh, black Studies. Black Studies. So did people have to be black to sign up? No, I'm mostly black, but there was a couple of white students. Oh, okay. And how was that? How was that in the first couple of, I don't know if you've said this anyway, but how was that in the first couple of years? How long have you, how long has it been running now? Well, the undergrads are done now. They closed it. So They closed it, it down? Yeah. So, so we've it's, done. Not, it's not offered in masters or anything either. So we've got a masters. It's still running for next year. Nice. Um, undergrad started 2017 and ended last this year. Like, well, it's still second year, third year still, but it's yeah, not first. Yeah, yeah, year. yeah, but still. How? What's the difference? Can, can you notice a difference? Maybe in the people that are taking it up, or their understanding of the topic when you first came versus now. You know, when we first like, had a lot of mature students. When we first came, there was a lot of mature students. Most students were mature students. Okay. Um, and now it's like the diehard youngest people who are like, to be fair, all the time people. If you're gonna do black studies degree. In, then twenty seven thousand pound on it. You're always gonna be like you're gonna be committed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's selected, yeah. self selected out of people. Yeah. <laughs> they were very yeah. interesting. But we always, you know, we also always we had a lot of mixed race um, people interested in identity, like you mm -hmm. know, which is also interesting mm -hmm. as well. Like people who are mixed with black. Yeah, who okay, were like, you know, yeah. I want to know more about identity stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And actually, even the younger people who are mixed with similar as well. Um, Do you know what? Like, I want to learn more about. Learn one more about okay what is interesting about that thing you said about mixed race or mixed with black which i don't know if this is controversial but we'll see um there is a big thing that i've noticed and i saw it online yesterday even so that's why i'm bringing it up now which is like it feels like a lot of the faces of black liberation in the uk seem to be like mixed people who are mixed with black if that makes sense, in the sense of, and I get that in the sense of like, if everyone's black, so it doesn't actually really matter. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, it's like a black person, it's not like someone is cosplaying or anything. And yeah. the experience in the UK can often be that there's no difference between me being mixed race and me being black, right? And all the different shades in between, and all that stuff. Understood. But I think there's something really interesting that you notice when it comes to like the faces. Mm -hmm. of like liberation campaigns and all that stuff and it tends to be the same people and i get america obviously that one drop of black blood and all that kind of stuff in their histories it makes sense in the uk sometimes i think sometimes it's very like not an issue but interesting to be like actually how comes it feels like a lot of the prominent names um or the people that people are pushed tend to be seem to be you know mixed or mixed with black and i wonder because and i say that because maybe there's there, there's a greater obligation on their back that they might feel to understand how to understand their lived experience. If I was if I was mixed with black, I think they might I wouldn't take blackness for granted in the same way of understanding yeah. it. I'll feel more. I would love to learn about it, but I wouldn't. But as a black person, it kind of feels like why are you learning it? You know yeah. what I mean? In like a formal setting. Yeah. So then I'm kind of thinking actually it makes sense why they would why there would be more of them vis visually because it's like yeah. yeah. Yeah, I definitely think that's part of it. Like, you can't, yeah, you, you have to think about it, right? If you make it mm. in a way that you don't necessarily, I mean, you, I mean, you should think about it. If, if yeah. You don't. But I think certainly, and then if you think about mainstream stuff, you know how mainstream works. Mm. They want light skinned people <laughs> generally. Like, like, no, but this, this is the thing, isn't it? And I think with black, I think with the black movement, the reason why I sometimes say these things or want to, not because I'm trying to be provocative, but I have no ambition to be provocative. But I don't actually, it's not something that I, necessarily enjoy but I think it's more that we shouldn't be so scared not to touch that subject because when you touch oh, yeah. the subject sometimes it's like it's not a big deal and we can just say yeah we recognize it but we understand but the more we don't touch these subjects it ends up being like the denial that Christianity was used to enslave <laughs> people because you don't want to touch it yeah, yeah now yeah. we haven't got that conversation it's like yeah I get it. it's not comfortable of course there's millions of billions if not billions of people going around who are Christian who believe in God rightfully so but why must you not address the fact that the Bible was used to do such a thing, even though obviously it's the heart of man that would do that regardless of the scripture that yeah, you're yeah. using or not, but it's okay to address it. When you don't address it, it's like we all just have this elephant in the room and it's like, 
you actually Christianity was used to enslave black people, so why are we using it now to liberate them? I wouldn't understand, you know. So, <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah. yeah. Are you are you religious in any way? I'm not really. I'm not really. No, I'm not really. I'm not really. I don't have religion. Spiritual or anything? Spiritual, like I believe in something. But mm. I would say like that. The, I kind of get church, like I get why, but like when I go, I get this the the um, what's the? I like the music, but not the lyrics. Like I get the idea of being the, the idea of praying to something, the idea of thank being thankful, the idea of worshiping it. But mm-hmm. the lyrics are like start reading the Bible, I'm just like, eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah, it does do, be you, do you sometimes you feel like there's a tension between intellects or intellectualism and like religion, particularly Christianity? Um, I, I think any religion, right? You have to the idea you're going to believe that these books that are written by men. Oh, the word of God. That's what I can't get over. Like I just, I, did, I know intellectually, like, yeah, I know they weren't written by God. Like they were written by men. So yeah. intellectually, even if I, even if I wanted to, I can't. That's a hurdle I can't jump. Right? Can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't think it's impacted your like ability to empathize or all that kind of stuff. You don't think it? No, I I think I get it. I think I get it. I understand it. I'm, uh, I mean, you know, I'd actually say I'm kind of jealous of people who have faith in that way because really? I can see why that would be something that would be affirming. Yeah, and helpful in, in trouble. Yeah, times. and community, especially can we think about community? Mm, that's that's yeah. where the community is, right? Church, mm. mosque. That's real community. Mm. So, but I got probably. What about you? Are you religious? Religious. I get. I I would say yes. I believe in God. I definitely believe in God. My dad's Muslim. My mom's Christian. Mm. So from that, it was always like a. I looked for the similarities to make it make sense. It yeah. was more like okay, the Abrahamic religions. To this point, you agree. Everything mm-hmm. else, I would naturally downplay as important things. The difference, the difference is being unimportant. But the the thing of like one God, you know, believing in that in in, in the Abrahamic story and all that stuff, yeah. But ultimately, I think I focus on more on God and the, that God relationship. Um, just because, as you said, there's so many different like things that you question, and you're like, hold on, how did this happen? Also, I don't want to now make excuses and go. It says it was written in seven days or seven in seven days. But now I have to say that seven days in the Bible doesn't mean seven days. It means 7,000 years. You, you get to that point where nothing actually means what it means. Yeah. So let's just get to the, the, the message, you know? So I think yeah. that's where I really am. I'm more like, okay, let's get to the message. What can I see with what I understand um, and move forward? But my personal journey, particularly um, as it pertains to like seeing the genocide unfold, in Palestine or against the Palestinians, um, seeing the lack of response from the church or Mm. people of faith has been very disheartening. And it made me think that my religion is fragile, but my love for God or relationship with God isn't. So my religious engagement is very much like, um, but my my thing with God is, is, is God willing is like, is steadfast, but yeah, I think, Christianity right now, I think it's a, it's, I don't know, it's in a, it's in a troubled place. But I guess when when hasn't it been in a troubled place? You know, when hasn't it been too early? Well, yeah. But I that could be a whole podcast. That could be but, a whole podcast. But I see, I meet a lot of people who are Christian who no, I don't meet a lot of people who are Christian who are pro Palestine, which is unfortunate. But when I do <laughs> meet people who are at least if you explain to them without saying Palestine and Israel, they would be pro Palestine. But once you say Israel and Palestine, they all of a sudden it's difficult to understand. It's like, no, remove the yeah. names, give you the situation. What is that? Is that not apartheid? Yeah. But once you add the names, that's when it's like, oh, well, I'm not sure. I'm thinking maybe you never know what happened on the day before October 6th and all that. So I think whatever. Um, so um, well, yeah, so seeing that, so meeting people who are Christian who don't have who haven't used their religion for good. Mm-hmm. scares me because i'm like if you if your religion doesn't teach you how to be good then what is the purpose of this thing so yeah i'm in that i'm, I'm, a, bit, I'm a bit of a weird place with that christianity thing right now yeah, yeah it's gonna be a whole podcast but i need to let you go this is a bit we, we yes we yes yes, yes, hey, yes. Hey, we should come back on for dinner like, this yeah is... of course listen once you hear it back or you play it back or you like if you like it it might back if you don't hear me back on this just know that he didn't like the episode which is totally fine <laughs> 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 which is totally fine and no, they use this as evidence if they if they do if you if they do you know arrest you god forbid obviously and if we, uh, this is not a co-defendant situation <laughs> <laughs> this is um, i'll just hey, just hey you were careful not to use any uh racial slurs right so yeah do you know what i mean i know right oh gosh yeah, i'll probably go to the, the questions around the, the carnival alone is probably hate crime at this point so <laughs>
<laughs> you might get dragged to the court of public opinion. But the know. prisons are full. So <laughs> apparently the prisons are full, but they love arresting black people for no reason. So. They love it. They love it. Anyway. They really love it. But yeah. But thanks for having me. It's no worries, thank you. It's been good just to talk to you actually. It feels like a conversation. Well, yeah, 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 we'll definitely get you back on. Yes, definitely. yes, yes. Thank Amazing. you. Uh all right, let me stop the recording. Yeah.